I know what it's like not to have any sleep at camp. So I feel your pain, Karen. So the last few weeks I've been talking about God's promises, you know, through scripture and and his encouragement or our encouragement through through scripture. And um, this morning I was thinking, well, what is a promise that God has given that helps us to be a Christian? And the thing that comes to mind is Matthew 7, 7. And for those of you, uh, a lot of you have probably heard this before. But here's the really cool thing. As I was reading the scripture this morning, I come across something that was very relatable to this day, which I think is really neat. And I'll... You'll hear it when I say it, or when I read it. It says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, then, though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Isn't that cool? You know, we're celebrating dads today, but for those who maybe don't have a dad or have a good relationship with your dad, the Bible tells us that our Father in heaven will give us what we ask. He loves us so much that he sent his only son to die for us. It's awesome. It's amazing when you think about it. That kind of love, I mean, to have that, that kind of love for, for one another, it would be amazing. That being said, let us pray. Dear Father God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for each one that is here. Lord, we just ask that you have your way in this service today. We ask that the tithes and offerings that are given, uh, that you bless them and use them to increase your kingdom. We ask that the message the pastor brings will be one that we can apply to our lives and that we can share with others. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and unable to be with us today. Lord, we pray for their healing. And for those going through other difficulties and struggles in their lives, Lord, we pray that you will make your presence known and that you will grant them your peace and your understanding. And Father, we are grateful that you do love us. We are grateful for the many gifts that you've blessed us with. We are grateful that we can come to you and and ask you for things and know that you hear our prayers. And for all that you do, it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. For six weeks with family, so we're glad you're back, brother. Thank you. And we're glad all of you are here today. God bless you. I, I don't remember who it was. If you know, tell me. But about 10 years ago, I met a guy, and he said, you know, I never knew my shoe size until I joined the Army. What happened is they were issuing uniforms, and he got to the counter with the shoes, and the guy looked at him and handed him a pair of size 12. And he looked at him and said, oh, I wear size 10. The guy said, you wear size 12. Take them. And he said, I went over and put them on. And he said, they were perfect. He said, I didn't know shoes could be comfortable. He grew up getting hand-me-downs that were always too small. He thought you always, everybody, curled their toes to fit into shoes. He was wearing shoes two sizes too small all his life. And he thought it was normal. He thought we were all as miserable as him. Somehow when we grow up, we have a very small knowledge of the world and we all think our family is probably pretty normal and things that happen to us are pretty natural and uh, we, we need someone to be our guide and the better they do, the better it is for us. And God wants us to learn in families. He wants us to learn from parents. He wants us to be nurtured in a special way. Look at this scripture with me from Psalm 78. We will tell our children and our grandchildren why they should praise the Lord. We will tell them about his strength, 
and the great things he has done. He gave his laws to Jacob's descendants, the Israelite people. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children, and the children would know about them, even the children still to be born. When the time came, they too would tell their children. Then their family would trust in God. They would not forget what God has done. They would obey his commands. God calls every generation to set the next generation up to know him and to know what he wants and how he works and to follow him. Kids need guidance in every area of life and they especially need it if they're going to know God and if they're going to be part of his plan. Some kids welcome that guidance, some kids resist it, but the Bible tells us that we need to give it. We need to make sure we do our part. It says in the New Testament, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There needs to be some patterns, there needs to be responsibilities, there needs to be things kids learn to do. Uh, they also need to understand. So it's not a bad thing to allow a child, to encourage a child to ask why. I want you home by midnight. Why? Well, because I said so. Well, at some point we do explain why. We do give reasons. We help them to understand. We give them instruction and discipline. A child needs the attention and guidance of parents. We need both parents growing up. A boy learns from both a mom and a dad, a girl the same. Uh, we need both genders. Sometimes our culture acts as if dads are somewhat dispensable, and it hasn't turned out to be true at all. Uh, there, we, there's disastrous results when dads are gone. Their influence, just being absent, is, um, is not good. You know, there are about 25 million kids today who are being raised in a home where their dad, their physical dad, their biological dad isn't there. And uh, God gives grace. God allows others to help with that. But it's still, uh, it's not reaping the harvest we wanted. You know, 71% uh, of high school dropouts come from a fatherless home. 85% of the young people in prison, fatherless homes. 75% of teens in substance abuse centers, drug problems. 90% of homeless and runaway kids didn't have a dad there. 63% of youth suicides. I found pages of statistics like this. It was sad. Uh, it's a setup when a dad is absent for a child to, uh, to make bad choices and it increases uh, the likelihood of crime, drug abuse, teen pregnancy, mental illness, all sorts of things. A child who doesn't have a father in the home is four times more likely to be in poverty. These children often grow up and create families like the one they came from, so it perpetuates. And that is not to say there's no hope. Of course there is. God is a God of hope. God is working. And there, are, there is grace in every life for whatever your situation. God wants to give you grace to succeed and to be healthy and to do well. And one of the things he does is he raises up churches like Crane Chapel. Crane Chapel began as a Sunday school. For the first 10 years, it was just a ministry to kids. And we had kids from this neighborhood, including Lowell over there, who came to this Sunday school as kids and learned about Jesus. And uh, they weren't all from perfect homes, but they found out that God is a perfect father and it made a difference in their lives. Uh, Karen just mentioned we sent 10 kids to camp this past week. We're sending three more uh, this uh, coming week. We had three as counselors last week, two this coming week. Uh, we're using our, um, the gifts that you give to give kids an experience at camp. Some of the younger kids will go in July. and. Um, we're going to have a float in the parade. We're going to reach out and let people know Crane Chapel cares about families. We'll be at the county fair. Uh, every hour that the uh, building is open, we'll be at the fair booth inviting people. And uh, thousands of people stop by our booth every summer. And uh, many kids come to Vacation Bible School the following week. We have Wednesday night. We have kids. We have teens. Now we have Sunday afternoons. We have a scouting group called Trail Life, 
and there's a group for girls. And so Crane Chapel is trying to help kids find Jesus and follow him early in their lives because that's the best time to know him. Before you make all those crucial decisions about what you're going to do, make sure Jesus is there. And so thank you. Thank all of you who, who give, who pray, who help, who participate in our ministry to help people know Jesus. Let's keep it up. Amen? Father's Day is a day to show gratitude to dads, to the other men in our lives who build into kids' lives. They make things better for a child at the very moment they bless them, and they make it better in the future. Do you know that God has put a hunger in the hearts of children to be blessed? You know that from your own experience. Kids long to be noticed. They want to be valued. They want to know that somebody cares. They want to know that somebody wants the best for them. And they want to be around people who cheer them on and guide them as they find their place in the world. Children need a blessing and they're looking for it. Jesus knew that and he modeled that. When Jesus would go into a village or a neighborhood, kids would run to him. And it says he, he, he would lift them up, the little ones, he'd lift them into his arms. And the older ones, he would lay his hands on them and bless them. The disciples thought he shouldn't be bothered with kids and they tried to t turn them away. And Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. Let them come, let them come. Kids need Jesus, and Jesus wants kids. There was a gal named Mavis, a church I was at in the Twin Cities. She's older. Uh, told me how when she was a little girl, on a summer day when they got company, she'd go outside and sit under the living room window. The windows would be open on a hot summer day, and she would sit there and listen to the adults talk because sometimes her dad would brag about her. And he would tell them uh, what she had done, her grades or something she had done. And he would never say anything to her to her face. He wouldn't compliment her to her face. But he would tell other people what a great gal she was. And so she would sit for hours under that window where there, no, nobody knew she was there, listening, hoping to hear something good about herself from her dad's lips. And stuck with her all those years. That's, that's how hungry she was for her dad's approval. Our parents, what they think of us matters. We need to know that we're important to them. We need to know they're glad to have us. You know, you may give up on a parent that doesn't meet your needs. You may at some point say, okay, I guess I have to live without that. But you never really uh, get past it. You feel the loss. And thankfully, other people can come into your life and provide healing love. And um, the best thing is when you realize that God is the ultimate father and he's the one that we can count on always. There was a 40-year-old man who, who felt this sense of loss in his life and he, he thought maybe it had something to do with his dad. His dad was in the military and died in battle when he was just three years old. And so he had grown up without his dad and he, and he felt the loss. He didn't quite know what to do with it. And one day, when he was 40, he was visiting his mom, and she handed him a picture of his dad in his uniform and said, I want you to take this. This is yours now. And as he took it from her, it slipped and fell to the floor, and the frame broke open, and a letter fell out from behind the picture. It was a sealed envelope with his name on it. And his dad had written him a letter when he was three years old and told him, how thankful he was to have a little boy. How happy he was that God was going to help his boy and that he was praying that God would make him all that he was meant to be in his life and told him that he loved him. And he was 40 years old, reading something his dad wrote when he was three. And the tears came and something happened in his heart. There was a, 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 something that was filled that had been emptied. Somehow it made him stronger. Somehow it still mattered what his dad had said 37 years before. The need for a father's blessing 
runs deep in the human soul. And it's true for a mother, it's true for others who matter to us. But the Bible tells us about an incident like that in the very first book. God called Abraham to be the first Jew, the first Hebrew, the first one to start a new nation. And he had one child, Isaac, and he blessed his child and he told him the heritage and, he, and, and Isaac came to know God. And Isaac had two boys. They were twins, Jacob and Esau. And uh, the oldest one was Esau. And so Isaac assumed that he would give the blessing of the family le leadership to his son Esau. And so uh, he planned it. Now, Isaac lived to be 180 years old. His sons were born when he was 60. So they were 120 when their daddy died. Now, I don't know when Isaac gave this blessing. He wanted to do it before he died, but he usually people waited till they thought death was maybe near. But when he gave this blessing, his boys were grown up men. And they were dads. They were probably grandpas. They might have been great grandpas. But the blessing of their father still was important to them. It was so important to Jacob that he stole it. He, he came into his dad. Uh, his dad was weak. He was in bed. He was blind. He couldn't see. And uh, he came in and pretended to be his older brother. And he said, Father, I'm ready for the blessing. And Isaac blessed Jacob and gave him the blessing of the oldest son. And it turned out that Jacob is the one that became the family leader, the, the leader of the Hebrew people. In fact, God changed his name to Israel. You may have heard that. The whole nation was named after him. But he stole that blessing. It wasn't meant for him. And so Isaac was fooled. He gave the blessing to Jacob, thinking he was blessing Esau. And now let's pick up the scripture at that point. Esau came in and said, Father, sit up and bless me. And Isaac asked, who are you? He answered, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac was so shocked that he trembled violently. He asked, then who was it that brought me food before you came in? I, I blessed him, and it's too late for me to take back my blessing. When Esau heard that his father, what his father said, he let out a loud, agonizing cry and wept bitterly. Can you picture this? just broken up. He said to his father, bless me, me too, father. But Isaac said, your brother came and tricked me. He's taken your blessing. Then Esau asked, haven't you saved a blessing for me? Do you only have one blessing, father? Bless me too, father. Then Esau broke down and wept. Of course, he would bless both sons, but only one would inherit the family leadership. Only one would carry on the family mission. And it was going to be Jacob. And God was in it. God wanted it to happen. He, didn't, he was not in the lying and all the rest. He wasn't in that. But Jacob is the one God meant to be the leader. But Esau's a grown man, an old man, and he still feels the loss that he didn't get what he thought he would get from his dad. Join the group, he saw. Most people don't get everything they expect to get. And from dads, from moms, from anything. And Esau was one of those who was greatly disappointed. Well, some of you know Pete Rose. Pete Rose was a uh, a great baseball player. In fact, he broke Ty Cobb's long-standing record for the most career hits. And on the day he did that, uh, he hit the ball, he got on base, and when he was, uh, when the umpire said safe, the place erupted with people standing and applauding and yelling. Didn't matter which team they were cheering for, here was a guy who just set a new record for base hits. And Pete Rose is standing on base, and Everywhere around the stadium, there's great celebration. 
reporter asked him afterwards, what were you thinking standing there seeing all that? He said, I thought about my dad and I hoped he was looking down from heaven and that he was pleased. There's a man at the height of his career. There's a man with uh, the approval of thousands of people. Here's a man known by millions for what he's just accomplished. And he's thinking about his dad and hoping for his approval. Norman Schwarzkopf led our forces in the Gulf War uh, in Iraq, 100-hour war, and he scored a great victory. And when someone asked him what he thought, he said, I, I think my dad would be pleased. I think my dad would be proud of me. There's something about a dad's approval that can matter to people, and it's meant to. But you know, we're all meant to give a blessing. We're all meant to help people grow. It can be a simple compliment. It can be a comment to a waitress or a cashier or someone else in your life. It can be a few sentences on a greeting card. You might write three thoughtful sentences on a birthday card. And that kid may save that card well into adulthood. Tuck it away with the other things from childhood they want to keep. Some of you know that's true because you have one. Something a grandparent said or an aunt or a, a friend. It means something to be blessed. And anybody can pronounce a blessing on anybody else. And we need to watch for opportunities to do that. But we should be especially intentional with our own families. It's meant to be a way of life with spouses that we support and encourage and compliment one another. There's a, there's, a, there's a story about a fella on their 50th anniversary, and uh, someone asked him, how is it that you and Sarah have had such a great marriage, 50 years? And he pulled out a pocket watch, and he popped open the cover, and he said, I got this from Sarah's dad on our wedding day. L look at it. And engraved on the glass, it said, say something nice to Sarah. Now you use your phone for time, but every time in his, all, all those years he looked to see what time it was, he didn't always notice, but there it was, say something nice to Sarah. And he did, he said, I often did. I, it reminded me and I would say something nice. He said, I think it made a difference. Well, of course it would, of course it would. Because when you say something nice, you're giving a blessing and a blessing it's like fertilizer to the soul. It's like water to a dried plant. It restores, it refreshes, it encourages. And we're all meant to do that. And sometimes uh, it can happen spontaneously. It can be a blessing just in the kitchen while you're making a peanut butter sandwich, in the car while you're dropping someone off, in the backyard while you're just there. You can say something that'll register. Some of you remember things that were said to you when you were five years old or 10 years old, and you're pretty old now. I can tell. Why do we remember those things? Well, either they really blessed us or they hurt us. But the blessings are the ones that we, we want to hang on to. We're meant to hang on to. And sometimes we can... Um, Make it formal, but it can be just part of life. Every bedtime, at mealtime, uh, some families, they'll sit around the table and say something about each person. Bedtime, a prayer, and a blessing. One lady prayed with her kids every day before they went to the bus. And uh, one day they, she prayed with them, they went out. A minute later, she, she saw them. A few minutes later, she saw them coming back, and they had five kids with them. And she said, what's up? She said, well, they don't have anybody praying for them. They want you to pray for them. They found out these kids' mothers prayed for them, and they, they wanted to be prayed for. There's something about that. How cool is it to be the praying person at work or in your neighborhood? 
The people come to you. They want you to pray for them. You know what people do? They do. It's a little harder for men than women, as a rule, to, to get the words out. And so it's all the more important that we work at it because it's, uh, it makes an impact. And it doesn't have to be dad. It can be an uncle or a neighbor or a guy at church, a teacher. A blessing can be short and simple. can be, good job, I'm proud of you. It can be, I love you, you make me happy. I'm grateful, I'm your dad or your uncle. <clears throat> when I was a teacher, I would take post-it notes sometimes when a, I'd score tests and I'd take a post-it note and write good job or when a kid did something, I'd write, you know, just a, just a sentence. And I often came by and I would see those stuck uh, to a notebook or, or something. Sometimes there'd be a whole bunch of them. They hadn't thrown any of them away. And it was, just took a minute, but it was important to that person to be recognized. And um, it's important when a child is in a sport or an activity or gets a report card to recognize that. But a blessing goes even beyond. A blessing just says, I'm glad you are. I'm glad I know you. I'm glad you're here. You mean something to me. It can be spontaneous, but there's also a time where it should be figured, it should be planned. In the Jewish families, they have bar mitzvah. A boy or a girl at age 13 is recognized as having come to adulthood. And uh, there's, there's a special day for them, a party for them. And they're recognized, and often there'll be a prayer of blessing over them by their parents, their grandparents, others. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. And if you think, well, you don't want to spoil kids, don't worry about spoiling kids with compliments. The world won't let them stay spoiled, okay? Just pour it on. Pour on the praise and the love. Now, I suppose it can be overdone, but it hardly ever is. Really, it hardly ever is. Just praise and, and appreciate kids. That formal blessing, like, uh, like they do at a bar mitzvah, can look something like this. Alan or Alice, I love you and always will. We all thank God you're in this family, and we enjoy having you around. You have a great sense of humor, and everyone can tell you're the dog's favorite person. It's very satisfying to see how you are growing up to be the person God created you to be. We're all proud of you. Now that's going to mean something, isn't it? It's simple. It's somewhat casual. But it's intentional. And that child will know it's heartfelt. And we can do that. We can express it as a prayer. We can have the person stand or sit in a special place. We can place our hand on their head or on their shoulder as we bless them. We can make eye contact. And it will mean something to a kid at any age, up to 110 for sure. It gives a sense of well-being. It gives a sense of belonging. It gives a sense of being wanted. And we need to do it. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Now, we can learn. My dad never told me when I was growing up, I love you. I don't think my mom did either. I asked my siblings, and they didn't remember. Well, they never heard it. My dad's dad never said, I love you, never tucked them in. So we were raised that way. But somehow, in the years, our dad learned. My mom died when I was pretty young, but my dad lived up until about six years ago. He was 97. And for the last 30 years, every time we talked, he'd say, I love you. Once in a while, he'd say, I'm proud of you. And it meant something to me. He learned. And I tried to learn and do it with my kids. We can learn. We can do a little better than we're doing now, can't we? And we can hand off that blessing that God wants our kids to have. Paul wanted to do that for the people he loved. He wrote to the Romans, I know that when I come to you, I will bring the full blessing of Christ. 
Hey, that's a good goal. Whoever you are in my life, I want to bring the full blessing that God wants you to have through me. It goes for the mailman. It goes for the closest people. I just want to bring the full blessing God meant for me to give. Do you want that? Ask God to help you, help God to prompt you, help God to help you to see the opportunities. Help him, ask him to help you especially with the kids in your life who need that blessing. I didn't know about Jimmy Wayne. He's a country western singer. Anybody know Jimmy Wayne? Okay, he's not that famous. But Jimmy never knew his dad. His dad just wasn't in his life. His mom, she was part-time. She was in jail a lot, so he didn't get much quality time with his mom. When he was 12, she got out of jail, and, and he went with her, but she had a boyfriend, and he was running from the law. And so for about a year, they were just, he just kind of lived in the back seat of an Oldsmobile, and they just were going from place to place, no plan, no nothing. And then when he was 13, they were in Pensacola, Florida, and they went to the bus depot, and the car stopped, and his mom said, Jimmy, get out. And he got out of the car, and it drove away. 13 years old, no money, no plan, no place, no nothing. On his own at 13. Not a blessing, an abandonment. He became a homeless kid. He got by whatever way he could. He was walking up the street and he saw an old guy working in his garage and he took a chance and he said, hey, mister, you got any work I can do? And the guy looked at him and said, well, yeah. He said, here, I'll show you how to use my lawnmower. You can cut the grass. And so the kid cut the grass, Jimmy, and they gave him $20. That was a few years ago, probably quite a bit. And they said, come back next week. And Jimmy was invited into the house, and, and the, the Costners gave him lunch and talked to him and asked him how he was doing and what his life was like. And Russell and B just took an interest in him. And by the end of the summer, they invited him to come and live in their home. They said, we have a bathroom and a bedroom that will be for you, and you have a place at the table. We'd like you to stay here. You can get back in school. And Jimmy lived there for six years. He finished high school. He went off to college. And they gave him a chance at life. They gave him the stability and the encouragement and the love that made him want to make his life count. He didn't end up in drugs or prison or something else. He ended up becoming successful in his career. And now he's an advocate for kids in foster care. And he's grateful. And some of you today, it's Father's Day, and we're going to appreciate and, and thank and encourage the, the dads in our lives and other men. And some of you, it won't be your biological dad that you'll think of. It'll be somebody else who was there for you, like Russell was for Jimmy. And they were a difference maker. And God says, be grateful. Let's be grateful. Let's give our best to those who have given us their nurture and their life. If you're dead and you haven't done so well, and I understand that, let's do the best we have now. Let's give what we have now. And let's make this day count. Because God's not done yet, is he? We're going to close with a song and then a prayer.
for today for the fathers, husband, and godly men you have raised up to protect us. Provide for us and enrich our lives in so many ways. We are grateful for those who are our anchor of stability and safety in our lives. During the turbulent times, we have benefited from their strength, loyalty, and perseverance. Thank you for bringing us examples we can follow and a source of wisdom we can trust. No human being is faultless, and we've sometimes been hurt by the failures of those meant to build us up. But we acknowledge that we have sometimes taken for granted the good things they've done and have sometimes wounded them. So we accept your gift of grace to forgive and to receive forgiveness and to move forward in your strength. Teach us to learn together, to honor them, and to express our love more freely. We ask for your favor on the men we love, rely on, and journey with on life's road. Bless them and guide them, build them up, and provide all they need to pass along your love in its many forms. Keep them in times of temptation or discouragement or hardship. Draw them ever closer to you so that their hearts beat in tune with yours and overflow with goodness for all around them. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you and count it a privilege to call you Papa. Keep us in your will and make us more and more like your son Jesus until you call us home to spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's be a blessing today, all of us. Let's be a blessing. That song we just sang, uh, Mr. Spafford uh, wrote it on a ship. They lived in Chicago. There was a big fire and it burned down much of the city, including their home. He sent his wife and his four kids on a trip on a boat. The ship sank. His children all drowned. And as he was going to meet up with his wife in England to comfort her, he wrote this hymn. He had asked the captain, will you tell me when we're near the spot where that ship went down? And he wrote this great testimony, it is well with my soul. His heart was broken, his life was in, um, uh, crumpled. He and his wife ended up back going to Israel, spending the rest of their lives there ministering and serving God in, a, in, a, in a, a place that was forlorn. Israel was a, a, a ugly a place, um, dry and dusty and poor, but they poured out their lives in ministry. Uh, we have pain in our lives, but we have opportunities. Let's be a blessing. Anybody want to do that? I want to be a blessing. Amen. God help us. Amen. God is good. Yes, he is. He's good all the time. God is good. You know he is. He's good all time. You can search the whole world over. No greater friend you'll find. He's not good just once in a while. He's good all the time. God is good. Yes, he is. He's good all the time. God is good. You know he is. He's good all the time. Search the whole world over, no greater friend you'll find. He's not good just once in a while, he's good all the time.